Okay, so, so my name is Jazz, and I work at UHN and Women's College Hospital. I, I take care of all sorts of patients with muscle, jo joints, ligaments, bone, tendon disorders. I'm a sports medicine specialist. We take care of a lot of professional athletes, and you know, I kind of deviated along the normal path about a year and a half to two years ago, and I decided to do an MBA, which a lot of people said don't do it. There's no use in doing it. But I, as a surgeon who's really never had any experience to innovation or the business world, I thought it was a really good experience. Next slide. Uh, these are some of the people along the way that have influenced me, and they teach all across the world. They have innovated, and they have their own companies. So next slide. I, I, I describe this picture as the life of a doctor or surgeon who, who never has a desire to innovate. It's a very comfortable life. It's very predictable. Uh, there's the hash marks in the road kind of represent the milestones that you would see as, as the years go on. And you know, it's very comfortable and there's no reason to leave this road. So, but I think if, if you have curiosity and you're asking questions and you want to change the system, you do have to challenge the status quo and this audience is probably not new to that concept. Preaching to the choir. Uh, next slide. So I think for me, I mean, starting an innovative process or trying to do something innovative was very daunting because you don't necessarily have the, the skill set or the tool set to do it. I'm trained to be a biologist, uh, taking care of patients, doing surgery, and trying to innovate or change something is, once again, I thought pretty daunting initially. So we had a, we had a retreat at the Department of Surgery, and we tried to figure out, you know, how can we innovate within the Department of Surgery, and we came up with these big vision statements that are kind of lofty and, you know, they're kind of abstract. And I think ultimately, if you s sum it up. Um, you realize that you know, vi a vision, no matter how lofty or ambitious it is, can only be accomplished with proper leadership. And leadership's really synonymous with change management. Change management is really synonymous with innovation. And if you want to improve a given area, you have to innovate. You have to evolve. So I learned that the first source of innovation is you've got to realize your, your unfair advantage. What is it that you're naturally good at? And for me, that's medicine is healthcare. I understand the healthcare value chain better than most people. Maybe not that guy right there who's going to speak next, but uh, I understand healthcare. Um, and then you have to leave your comfort zone. And I think the previous speaker said the patients have to get uncomfortable. But I think if you're trying to change something, and for me in healthcare, you've got to get uncomfortable. You've got to do something you've never thought about before. Uh, next. So I really think innovation is if you take your competitive advantage, what are you good at? You combine it with something you've never thought about before, you can create value in any particular endeavor. So I think, I think the theme I, I read was this is innovation in surgery or in the surgical room, but I think innovation in surgery is already happening uh, in a certain way. So if you look, a lot of it is product and device oriented. I think as surgeons, as engineers, as big pharmaceutical and device companies, we're actually pretty good at innovating when it comes to techniques and devices and implants. We perform surgery through one centimeter portals and do complex reconstructions. And that's a complex rotator cuff reconstruction um, and examination that you're seeing that we're actually decompressing the suprascapular nerve, something that would never be done through a one centimeter incision a decade ago. Um, the, the picture on your top is a picture of a, comp a product designed by Vitality one of the winners of the XPRIZE competition to detect uh, a patient's vital signs so patients can track their signs on their own remotely and communicate through the cloud with various EMR systems as well as physicians who may or may not be interested. And I think we're, we're using lasers. Neurosurgeons use lasers to take out brain tumors. Surgeons print, 3D print certain implants that they, you know, op that they kind of implant at the time of surgery and we're using nanotechnology and stem cells. So I think in a certain way, surgeons are innovating and device companies and pharma companies are innovating. Uh, back, previous, please. But I think there's so much more we can do. And I, and I think really it's about not so much in the operating room because I think incrementally over time that will refine itself. It's really about innovating around the healthcare processes experienced by the patient. And it, I think this is some of the pathways you have in our healthcare value, in our healthcare chain, and certainly primary care and the patient is right at the center and it's a big mess. And there's a lot of influencers you see on your right hand side, including 
government and insurance and legislation and impending technologies like wearables and virtual reality, big data, education, a lot of contextual factors that influence what's going on in this big mess that you see on the screen. So I, I really think there's a huge opportunity to change the way we deliver healthcare in Canada, change the experience for the patient. And if, you know, based on some of the speakers I've heard, I think people are already starting to do that. Um, if you can just click through the a few times, that'd be great. So I think everybody wants in for Health 2.0. Um, Google is, has created a startup called Verily. It's an anti-aging company. They're trying to create all sorts of bio, bio, I guess, biotechnical devices such as contact lenses that detect uh, glucose levels so the patients don't have to prick themselves every day. Uh, League is redefining the way we implement health insurance. Apple Health Kit is trying to incorporate all your wearable data and make sense of it and integrate with EMR companies. Uh, keep going. Arthrex is a state-of-the-art device manufacturer making really, really cool implants that are bio biomechanically better than ever before. And Therapia is a startup that I'm part of that tries to change the way we deliver healthcare to patients because we really believe that the future of healthcare is in the home and we're taking small steps to you know, really reach a state where everything can be done at home, but incremental steps are being taken right now, which I can talk about. So I think there's also a few trends I'd like to mention. Uh, number one, I think that the boundaries between the physical world and digital world are becoming less and less clear. That's very obvious based on some of the talks today. There's a huge shift from a provider-centric system to a patient-centric system. I think for the first time, people are really trying to define what patient-centered care actually means. There's a huge demographic shift that's occurring. People are getting older, and by 2034, one in four Canadians will be over the age of 65. And that should really influence the way we contextualize the healthcare system and the processes that govern it. There's a huge emphasis on health promotion, injury prevention, and wellness. Here you see a picture of the catapult system, which is about really a biometric wearable technology that's GPS based, and they develop algorithms based on you know, athletes with velocity, acceleration, positioning, calorie exertion, to basically determine who gets injured, when they get injured, and how we can prevent it. So professional soccer players, football players, they all wear these devices in training, and people have identified that, for example, when a striker in soccer is sprinting, if the stride length changes compared to the baseline state, that's a risk factor for hamstring injury. Hamstring injury causes time away from sport, time away from sport causes is an economic loss to the team, they lose games, not good. So injury prevention is big for professional athletes and for consumers in general. I think net, uh, practitioners will just have to work together in networks. That's unavoidable. Next slide. And I think the patient, it's really going to be about the patient. They're going to be engaged. They're becoming increasingly engaged when they walk into my practice. They'll be empowered. I think it's all about facilitating patient empowerment. And they're going to be enabled by technology, just like providers will be enabled by technology. And I, I think when you try to collect information and come up with an idea, the next big idea, you got to leave your comfort zone, talk to people you normally wouldn't talk to um, in different verticals, in totally unrelated areas, and you'll come up with some really neat trends and themes that you'll combine with some of the aforementioned things we know are happening for sure. And you can come up with some good solutions. And so Therapia, just really quickly, is a health services marketplace that we created. And it kind of connects, at least in phase 1.0, patients with physiotherapists. And physiotherapists travel to the patient's home and try to redefine some of the pathways in which patients experience care. So for example, if someone's had surgery and they're 60 years old, they've had a hip fracture, it's really hard for them to move around. It's hard for them to get to a clinic. They can't drive. They may not have the caregivers that have the time or the attention or the energy to drive them. So it's really a way of connecting patients who need care at home with practitioners who want to provide that care and providing incentives and motivation for both to do it. So I won't talk too much about that, but other companies are doing really cool things about the delivery of healthcare and innovating the processes. Honor is a company out of California, uh, founded by one of the Google, actually founded by one of the um, guys who came up with, anyways, one of the messaging platforms, sold it to Google, worked at Google, and he created Honor. Uh, which is a huge company basically trying to redefine home care, trying to change the way we care for our parents and grandparents so they're empowered throughout their late years 
And once again, kind of emphasizing the concept that the future of healthcare may be in the patient's own home. Soothe is an on-demand massage platform in North America. Pager is an on-demand platform where a, a doctor visits your home just making house calls like they did about 100 years ago, but doing it on demand. So if you're a busy mother with kids at home, you can easily have a checkup in person and someone arrives to your door. Verily is a Google spin-off looking at healthcare startups or healthcare ideas, that is. And even IBM Watson is now creating artificial intelligence networks and neural networks to come up with diagnoses better than physicians and even experienced physicians. So I think, uh, I like this quote. It says, we are called to be the architect of the future, not as victims. So leaping from one S curve to the other is really about leaving your comfort zone and doing new cool things. And I think healthcare is overdue for both service and product innovation. I think changes in the way, in, in the way we deliver healthcare are going to ha happen sooner compared to products and technology that may revolutionize how humans heal. And I think product and device innovation needs to continue, but it'll only happen if we eliminate some of the barriers between verticals of medicine, technology, patients, and government. Next slide. And I think it always helps to think big if you're gonna think about healthcare innovation. This is a slide from a Matt Damon movie where if you believe that healthcare is in the home, science fiction often predicts kind of what's coming next. Uh, there could be devices that diagnose define and treat any condition in the comfort of the patient's own home. And next slide. That's all I got, thanks. Yeah. So you're trying to help patients get care at home and you talk a lot about how digital and physical are emerging, but what is the biggest challenge with home care? Because I imagine lots of homes aren't set up with the physical requirements to, to basically take care of patients. Yes, yeah, good question. So you cannot bring everything a clinic has to a patient's home, but you'd be surprised at how much you can accomplish with little equipment. And I think it's kind of realizing that at least in the current version, that providing care at home is more about convenience and empowerment and doing more with less and doing what's necessary than trying to do everything because most of the things that healthcare practitioners off offer probably are not necessary. And um, I think that's really our approach right now. As a, more as a complement rather than a substitute to traditional healthcare models. Yes? Just to um, take off on your, one of your last wrap-up points there about um, the changing the service and process of healthcare. Um, as a person in healthcare myself for 26 years, um, I would tend to think, like I, I'm not of the belief that healthcare will be changed by applications at all. I think that's nibbling at the edges. Right. Um, but would you agree that fundamental to really revolutionizing healthcare to move it to 2.0, 3.0 is really the payment system, the, the way we, we fund things in healthcare? Because I'm, I'm of the view that, when I did some work on Obamacare, I'm of the view that when you change how things are paid, things realign. And that is one of the Absolutely, a huge barrier to healthcare delivery is money. It's a good question. I, I don't think money solves every problem. Uh, for example, I think I'm speaking out of my area, but a lot of people didn't sign up for Obamacare, even though it was widely available. And I think there's there's some barriers in people just who don't want to get involved. Number one. In Canada, what can we do? I think if you make services accessible, people do use them. I think there is a supply-demand issue in terms, that, in terms of demand is way better than supply. And I think you can improve some things if they're accessible, but patients need to be motivated, they need to be engaged, and they need more than just objective reasons to, to kind of participate in their healthcare. So I think as long as you have 
some of the intangible elements in place, I think for sure, if you can fix the way things are paid and patients have universal health care, they will get the care they need. How do you get the uh, healthcare professionals? You talked about getting out of your comfort zone. Um, how do you encourage that? In other words, or like an example is a physiotherapist that, you know, he's always worked in an office, always had people come to him. How do you convince him that going to people is the better way? You know, you know for our model, it, it actually wasn't hard at all. That, that was one of the easiest things. We, we recruited 60 physiotherapists in two weeks. And when we first launched, and the reason was they made more money. When, when they work in people's clinic, the, the overhead of the clinic is such that the clinic takes about half of what they build, whereas you eliminate a lot of the overhead and inefficiencies with this model because you're relying on the skill of the physiotherapist without bricks and mortar, and essentially for the same amount of work, they made almost twice as much in some cases, or at least 1.5 times as much. So it was not a challenge, and we, and in terms of quality, we, we've been getting really good therapists. So I think, I'm not saying everyone's incentivized by money. There's other elements to it, like you manage your practice, you take away a lot of the administrative burdens that they would otherwise have in their own practice, or working in someone's practice. I think some of those um, things helped as well. Yeah. Why did you start with physiotherapy? You know, as an orthopedic surgeon, we're heavily involved in musculoskeletal care and physiotherapy is a natural extension. Every treatment protocol that we have involves some sort of therapy. So one, it's an element of familiarity. Two, it's an element of access. I have access to physiotherapists. I have good relationships with physiotherapists. And three, it's not governed by OHIP. I think trying to, trying to innovate within the public system alone is very hard to do. And I think at least in the current state, it was an easier space. Like we could have done massage, we could have done chiropractic, we could have done other private areas, but. I felt I had a competitive advantage and I understood physio the physiotherapy space. My co-founders understand the physiotherapy space and, and it's, we're actually in the healthcare market. We're not in the pure consumer market. So we wanted to innovate in healthcare and it was just different than massage and chiropractic and other non-OHIP streams and dentistry. Yes? What's that? Yeah. Yeah, I didn't really want to talk about therapia today, but if, yeah, no problem. No problem answering that question. Um, the our business model is that we basically get a percent uh, cut from the total exchange of money that happens for every appointment. So it's a commission-based model. And it's it's a marketplace where patients can go online. Um, based on the pr price of the therapist, which the therapist set, based on the user ratings, based on their profile, based on their geographic location. They can choose physiotherapists that are suited for them, and therapists then travel to their home at the patient's time, convenience, and flexibility to deliver the care that they want. Thanks, guys.